Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of our Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution by the Group of International Communists Reading Group Series. Today is Monday the 19th of July 2021 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week we read Chapter 3, The Unit of Account in Communism. This week I got a new patron, Ethan Fridmansky, to thank. If you'd like to join in the Reading Group Series listening to extra bonus episodes, or creating Discord over on the Discord server, head on over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. Okay, let's join the discussion. Okay, welcome everybody here to our fourth Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution reading a group series. Today we're on to chapter three. We're motoring along quite nicely This chapter is the unit of account in communism, where we're going to introduce, probably for the first time in the book, I think explicitly, the idea of a labour time accounting in communism. Okay, so we're going to be doing a little bit of Marxology and Engelsology. No one ever talks about Engelsology. We're going to do some Marx and Engelsology here today. So... If anybody can put up their hands who wants to take this first section to read it. Okay, Chris. Okay. Chapter 3, The Unit of Account in Communism. A. The Regulation of Production. In the Marxist explanation of the domination of the working class, we have seen that the real problem of communism lies in abolishing the separation of labor and labor product. It is not some supreme economic council, but the producers themselves who must have the disposal of the work product through their operational organizations. Only in this way can they become free producers and can then group themselves in mutual connection to the associations of free and equal producers. Since today's technology has socialized the whole production, all operations are technically completely dependent on each other. And together, from an uninterrupted working process, it is the task of the revolution to forge them economically together. But this is only possible if a general economic law unifies the whole economic process. This association is of a completely different nature than the so-called socialization theories. These have never had anything else in mind but the organizational merger of the different branches of production. They deal with the question which industries have to be united and how the problem is solved organizationally and technically. This has nothing to do with the laws of movement of a new economic system. The general economic law, which unites the entire economic process, therefore says nothing about the organizational unification of the economy. It only establishes the conditions under which the producers, united in the operational organizations, participate in the great general economic process. These conditions must, first of all, be the same for each part of the total process. In contrast to Lenin, who starts from the principle to organize the whole economy on the lines of the postal service. That is our immediate aim. We say, Equal economic conditions for all parts of social production, that is our first demand. Only then, the question of the technique of organization can be addressed. So, we're trying to get to this idea of what kind of of economic laws can be the basis for these free and independent workers' councils to operate? What kind of economic laws can, can cohere this, this new system? And he's trying to make this distinction between what the social democrat or the Bolshevik approach was, where they had these ideas of a, you know, kind of organizational approach to socialism. Not like a a new economic foundation so much, but like a kind of technical organization of the different branches of production. So, and he's going to kind of juxtapose what Marx and Engels were saying versus these kind of a, a technical idea. Does anybody want to say anything on, on, on this section here? Just show your hands up. 
there is a quote here from Lenin, which to me, the word Im- immediate, I think is kind of a fairly important word there because I think immediate it, it, it does a lot of work there for Lenin. Why do I say that it's doing a lot of work immediate? Because like, you know, I think you could interpret that immediate a number of ways that can be kind or unkind to Lenin. Alex? Well, I'm not so sure about immediate, but the the uh, only, the, it, the, it's actually the last sentence I want to speak about, the only then the question of the technique of organisation can be addressed. I mean, the, the organisation was of fundamental importance, I think, at the time of this being written, because there was a danger of people starving. You know, they just, you know, come out of the First World War. They'd lost an awful lot of their industry after the um, rest, the Bosch, what you call, uh, treaty. I, I, I think it, it's fair to say that, like, organization, treating organization of fundamental, uh, of, as being of fundamental importance at that time is a, a valid thing. Yeah, that, that was the Brest Litovsk Treaty, That's I think. think. Yeah. When they, they lost, what, like 40% of their iron industry or something? And, a uh, uh, Herman. Uh, I think it's less a, techn- a practical problem uh, what Lenin uh, speaks on here. It's more a se- theoretical idea of uh, communism uh, he has when he says to organize the whole economy on the lines of the postal service. That is our immediate aim. In uh, some other papers, he writes about... Uh, the distinctions between socialism and communism, as uh, the way he understands it, he says that this is a complex transition from capitalist society to even one of the approaches to communist society. And this I think we will see later also in this chapter when they quote Marx. Marx uh, did never speak of a socialist first phase and, and then the second uh, communist. He dis- does not distinguish in this. In this way, he if he speaks of a first and a higher phase of communism, he always speaks about communism. And I think this is the main difference what, what they want to highlight here, that, that Lenin had an understanding of the first socialist phase, a very complex transition from capitalist society. And they, uh, in difference to this, they say this is not a technical or practical thing. Communism starts... It's a, right at the beginning with abolishing the separation of labor and labor product. And this is, this is something absolutely different to what uh, Lenin describes here. Next was Chris. I just went to that passage in the State of and Revolution that he was quoting. It's from chapter three, and, and Lenin is describing for his idea of socialism a scenario that comes from uh, the Paris Commune about with the state being taken over by the armed workers and all these uh, skilled uh, professionals and technicians being paid workmen's wages, which is, you know, a very different thing. And I thought that was important context here. So say a little bit more about that, Chris, by what you, what, what you mean here by it's important for its context. Like, are we saying here that Lenin is, in this passage, saying something along the lines of a, a labor time calculation? It's my understanding. I haven't read that, that uh, Civil War in France in a long time. But Marx describes, and I guess it happened where, you know, these uh, professionals are paid working wages, workmen's wages, as it were, instead of their exorbitant salaries beforehand. Th- that's not the same as being paid, you know, for labor time. You're still preserving, um, you know, uh, the, the value form. You're just reducing it to the minimum for the people who were, you know, privileged beforehand, which I guess is easier to do in at the beginning. But uh, I, I don't really see them advocating that in this book. Yeah, so there's a difference here because we're going to talk about labor time and the connection between the product and the hours of work you've done and not a wage, which they still kept there. Alex. So just quick, could you indulge me? Do you mind if I just read the full sentence of the the Lenin quote? The dot, dot, dot is important. So to organize the whole national economy on the lines of the postal service, so that the technicians, foremen, bookkeepers, as well as all officials shall receive salaries no higher than a workman's wage. 
under the control and leadership of the armed proletariat. That is our immediate aim. Which doesn't sound massively different from equal economic conditions. So that would still maintain uh, a wage form. So that's not getting that direct link between the product and the, the work. But it would definitely be an egalitarian solution, but not one that in the end they they stuck to, which you know probably has a lot to do with material conditions. Chris. Yeah, quickly, I just want to say it's 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 a very rough uh, way of leveling class distinctions, but probably not one with a lot of longevity. Will would like to speak. Will. In terms of transition, wouldn't you need, for, for this to make any sense in terms of the, the scheme provided here, wouldn't you need to abolish the distinction between work and work product in the productive sectors prior to any of the social sectors? Like, how could you do it in the you know, post office first, because right, like, don't they depend on like society's surplus to operate? So are you talking about Lenin here? Or are you talking about what the GIC are saying? So Lenin is saying our immediate aim is we need to turn the post office and level wages, right? And then obviously that's not what the fundamental principles is talking about. But the question is, like, if we were to implement the what's proposed in the fundamental principles, could you abolish the distinction between work and work product in the post office before you've abolished it in productive industries. No, I, n- yeah. no, I, I think it's like, it's a societal, you right. know, it's like, it's a, it's a, it's right. a yeah. drastic society wide level change. It's not like we're going to do it in like, you know, the shoemaking place first and then we'll do it in this place. So they're here. You know, I think it's, these are our new, this is our new legal system. We're going to right. run yeah. with it. Yeah, that was my main point, is that you, it doesn't make sense to, to, to do it just in, for the postal service, right? Chris, do you want to keep going here from the same economic conditions? The same economic conditions primarily relate to the implementation of a general binding fixed measure according to which all calculations are carried out in production and distribution. This measure can no longer be money because no third person inserts himself between the worker and his product. Here, the worker is not alienated from the social product of labor. Indeed, the worker does not directly consume the product produced by himself. Still, his product has something in it that all social goods have in common, the socially necessary working time that costs their production. All goods are therefore qualitatively completely equal from a social point of view. They differ only in the amount of social work they have absorbed in the production process. Just as the benchmark for individual working time is the working hour, the measure for the amount of social work contained in the products must be the socially average working hour. Thus, as a compelling demand of the proletarian revolution, it turns out that all operational organizations are obliged to calculate for the products produced by them how much socially average working time they have taken up in production, and at the same time to pass on their product according to this price to the other operations or to the consumers. Furthermore, the operational organizations receive the right to receive the same amount of social work in the form of other products in order to be able to continue the production process in the same way. In this way, all participate in the production process under the same economic conditions. If this regulation of distribution and production is carried out, then the whole economic life, which is already socially connected by the division of labor, is now also economically, i.e. socially regulated. So this is where we're getting on to our, our idea of this labor time accounting here as the law, the generally binding fixed measure. You see, like under capitalism, you know, we do have a very, very similar measure. You know, it's it's nearly identical as in, you know, we've got our socially necessary labor time. But then in, in capitalism, we have a value which has and we have the price. So we've got like, you know, form different than, you know, the underlying essence. And, you know, when you look at the exact equations of Marx's you know, when he's dealing with like C, you know, constant and variable capital and surplus, like we have our C plus our V, so our constant and variable and our surplus. 
that that's our kind of our general equation. But we're going to come to our equation later on, and it's going. We don't have this idea of variable or surplus. We literally just have our our C and you know a labor amount. And this small, this like kind of pretty mathematically trivial distinction is what actually causes everything to flow out of. And this is our binding measure. Like, and if we look at this sentence here, the measure can no longer be money because no third person inserts himself between the worker and his product. Okay. The worker is not alienated from the social product of labor. You can make the case that even under communism that like the laborer would still be kind of alienated in a certain sense from his output. You know, like I make a mobile phone in a factory in China and, you know, somebody even under communism saying, you know, the, that phone I'm not going to use, somebody else is going to use it. So there is still like a form of alienation, but it's 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 much different than like what is alienation under capital. Uh, Donald put up his hand. Yeah, I think that's that's right. But I think one thing that's good to bear in mind is like the root of it is that because labor itself is no longer a commodity, like there's no state or firm buying it. So, you know, you do a part of the social work that's kind of determined by a social plan and then you directly have a claim on the total product. And I think that's kind of the fundamental difference. Just as the benchmark for individual working time is the working hour, the measure for the amount of social work contained in the products must be the socially average working hour. So what we kind of need to say specifically here when it comes to like questions people have of implementation, the averaging is not done within a single council. So if you have a factory A with producing shoes, it's not factories A's average that is going to be the inverted commas price. It is the average over all firms making that similar product, like the at a guild level. So that is very important for people to understand. Because if it was otherwise, we would have the idea of market socialism, where we have different workers councils competing against each other in the market. So this is one way which this is one of the most important things for breaking the capitalist value form is how we determine our price and how we then go on to reproduce all of the factories in a non-competitive way. That doesn't mean it's not going to be productive. It's just not going to be non-competitive. And we're not going to be, we're not going to have the value system working its own magic. We're going to have our own planned system to meet human needs. Anybody have anything else to say on this or we'll go on to the next bit? Alex? Can I just have to ask a question then? So if I work in a factory that has low productivity, if I do an hour's work there, do I still have as much claim as a person who works an hour in a factory with high productivity? Yes. Okay, yeah, cool. You are based on your labour time. And it doesn't matter if, if your firm is more or less productive. And it doesn't matter if you are more or less productive. If I have really strong, you know, and I'm working in a, in a factory where we're doing a lot of lifting... I'll be more productive than the other guy, but I still will only get paid my, my hour. Sure. And in the plan, the factory, I'd say the workers' council, w- would a- agree in the plan to what is a an output for that factory at an average in- intensity. Okay. So that's how it's regulated. Okay. Um, so, so, well, why do we need to know that? Need to know which. So, okay. We know like how many hours the workers in the factory uh, have worked. And that, that allows them to go to the store and buy that many hours worth of, of produce. Why do I need to know the ratio of the specific factory's output to the social average? What would we do with that number? So, for example, like, let's say you have the three shoe factories. One is producing 1,000 shoes an hour, one is producing 2,000, and one is producing 3,000 shoes an hour. And the workers are all working at the same level of intensity. Okay, they have three different types of machines. Now, when, say, society decides we want to, say, produce more shoes and they might say we're going to bring in new production. We don't have enough shoes for people. We want more shoes for people. And society decides, okay, here's a lump of, you know, capital inverted commas that they give to the shoe makers guild. At then at the point, it would be necessary to know which which factories are less productive than others so that you can essentially 
um, most efficiently increase your productivity. So you would probably go to buy a new machine for the factory that is only producing at 1,000 shoes an hour. And you will be able to see, everybody can look, it's all going to be open. The information is all going to be out there. You'll be able to see the actual plans of what they should be doing for their productivity versus, you know, what is achieved in reality and discrepancies there. So society will be able to manage anything that goes awry in that process. Okay. Donald put his hand up. Uh, yeah, I was just going to mention the other reason for, for knowing the, the different productivities has to do with the, because there's no market, there's no market price formation. And so what you would have for sort of individual product service comparable types would be in order to set current prices, you need to know the average social production times of those products, you know. So that's kind of the, I think, the second very important thing about knowing the productivity of, of a given firm in terms of output, yeah, per hour. Okay, who wants to read the next section? Any any hands? Will. Are we at capitalism? We are at, yeah, we are at capitalism, that's right, baby. Capitalism tries to implement this regulation by organizational means by increasing the concentration of its power in the industry. What it succeeds in doing is only to organize the competition at an ever higher level, with ever greater catastrophes in the wake. It tries politically, according to the rules of democracy, to achieve a mildness of opposites, but this ultimately serves only to organize the last and deepest opposition, that between the owning class and the proletariat and to secure its continued existence. This social condition can only be overcome if the workers make themselves free. If they conquer the right of disposal over the means of production and participate in the economic process under equal economic conditions. However, the revolution does not only consist of a revolution of the economic conditions of production, but it also brings new economic conditions for individual consumption. If the workers have the right of disposal over the work product in their hands, then their relationship to this product must be determined and regulated on a new basis. For the workers do not have the right of disposal over the product, but no longer in the sense of private capitalism with arbitrarily free disposal. The disposal of the product can only take place under social and equal conditions. Producers and consumers are indeed free but only through their social ties. The same conditions for individual consumption can, in turn, only lie within the same measure of consumption. Just as the individual working hour is the measure of individual work, the individual working hour is also the measure of individual consumption. Consumption is thus also socially regulated and moves in completely exact tracks. The implementation of the social revolution is thus, in essence, nothing other than the implementation of the working hour as a measure in the entire economic life. It serves as a measure in production, and at the same time, it measures the producer's rights to the social products. The essential thing, however, is that this category is carried out by the producers and consumers themselves. Okay, so there's, there's quite a bit there. So there's one very important sentence here. You know, they're, they're kind of talking again here about bringing in the kind of, you know, general laws and linking it between the rights of the workers control over the product. But there's a, an interesting bit that it says here. For the workers do have the right of disposal over the product, but no longer in the sense of private capitalism with arbitrary free disposal. So I, I think this here is a dig at... The syndicalists. I, I, I do think this is a dig at the anarchists, which, you know, like this idea that the actual output of an individual firm is not linked to the workers of that individual firm. So, for example, you know, maybe in, under syndicalism, you know, you would have agreements between different factories for distribution or for sharing their outputs or whatever like that. But if you had a critical, say, key factory you would have more power, say, in a, in a syndicalist approach. So I, I think this is what he's getting at here, is that, like, even while, you know, that the, the outputs and the inputs to the actual production process are not the rights of the individual worker councils, those in charge of the actual day-to-day -day running of it, that society owns them and that they 
they use them to produce for society, but they do not own, they don't have arbitrary free disposal of the output. I also, I, I really like this idea that, you know, the, the beauty of the labor time thing is that, you know, it regulates both consumption and production through the single measure. I think that's very elegant. You know, it's very simple and very clean and easy for people to understand. Like, I, I, I feel like that this stuff is exceptionally kind of transparent, that there is no interest rates or hedge funds or any of this rubbish no patents going on, no uh, laws over here siphoning stuff to different places, that it's totally transparent. You know exactly what you get, you know what you put in, you see all your workers working with you, you know what their wages are going to be like. They're going to be paid on their labour time hours how much they come in like you. You don't have this idea of playing all the workers off against each other. It's it's highly, highly elegant. It's 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 a beautiful system any any comments here alex yeah I mean, it's elegant and and simple and i can at the limit of my imagination imagine like a some kind of like steady state economy you know working like this but if you want to develop your economy you want to build new stuff then you're going to have to have you know the states are going to be able to have to like create the, these tokens out of nothing which means you you'd have to have taxation as well to destroy them well, if you're thinking about it, the labor tokens or whatever we want to call them, they are created at the point of labor. OK, I think the idea of the state, I know we've said the state a few times. I think we probably shouldn't use the term the state. I think different types of worker councils is probably a better way to kind of think of it. But the tokens that are created just reflect the labor that's put in. Well, or, well, the, the, the labour that may come into existence in the future. I mean, if you want to build, I don't know, high-speed rail network, well, you just have to make some tokens and, and pay people to do it. Well, you don't need to pay them before they do the work, you see. You know, like, say we say you have the council system up and running. And yeah. We say yeah, yeah, but I don't have to, no, no, you're right. I can pay them when they do the work, but it doesn't. I don't have to pay them out of work I've already done. Well, you know, me working on the railway system at the exact same time we're building the railway system, at the same time we're doing that, other people are creating food and housing and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, so we're all producing. Every single day, society reproduces itself. Yes. So, like, it's a concurrent process. You don't need to save up. It's not like capitalism where you need to, under capitalism where you're limited by capital, here you're only limited by what your labor can achieve in a given time. No, well, there's no limit on that in capitalism. If you build a national infrastructure, you don't save up for that. So I'm not suggesting you do. I'm saying you need something analogous to the way capitalist government would work, which would be it would, you know, spend the money in, into existence. So well, you don't have a state spending tokens into existence as people do the work. Yeah, well, that's always what happens. It's like, you know, like literally workplaces, everybody turns up for work, they check in or they check out when they're finished they are credited immediately with the labor tokens and like we will we'll get to we, we'll get to this idea i know what you're trying to get to alex so we, we'll see it in the coming chapters when we see the equations and we get to understand how it regulates i think that's probably the best way of doing it because we'll we'll end up we'll get there i think it's just the easiest way of saying it i think we'll put his hand up yeah i was just gonna explain how it works later but if we're gonna move on <laughs> we can move on well, unless you want to have, do you want to have a quick go? Oh, I mean, the, yeah, they basically just have deductions from like the average working hour, right? So like if you need to pay for schools, instead of you getting a full hour back, you get, you know, nine tenths of an hour back and that subsidizes schools and the same thing can happen for investment, right? The that's distinction that being the, so that suggests that you deduct, save, and then spend on the, 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 the school was in practice, it wouldn't happen that way. You just spend out of nothing, create the school and deduct later. Well, yeah, you could you could kind of like amortize it however you want, you know, like make it flat. But the idea is that like, yes, if, you, if you're going to make a claim on the general social product, you know, it has to come out of yes. other people's labor. Yes. But like as well, it's in a plan. So you do know what the output is, you know, so you know the plan ahead of ahead of time. Like, you know what output levels will be in all sectors. And you know that we're going to say on the 1st of July, start building our, our high-speed rail. And at that point, when we start building, our tax rate will have to go up slightly 
to fund that, which means people consumption will go down. The communist tax rate at that point will go up to facilitate the production of that train at that particular time. Illuminat has put the hand up, I think. You- yeah, I think you don't need something like credit because the society will just decide to allocate so many labor hours or whatever for a new building project. That's why you don't need to save up or take credit to like finance something. But when you're down in, at the individual level and like one person wants to build a house or whatever, that's that's a different matter. I, I have no idea how that would work. Yeah, that that is that's totally different. Yeah, and I've, I'm actually thinking I'm actually going to write a paper on that. To be honest, I think that certainly leads to kind of strange things under communism. <laughs> so uh, let's not go there now. We'll never we'll never finish. But that, that's a very good point. But it definitely, like we're only communism uh, and with the plan and uh, with the labor time planning, you're only ever limited by what you can actually do, as opposed to limited by money. I know that states are actually not limited by money when they control over their own currency but they do like to let on that they are under capitalism you know mmt's is making inroads into people's understanding but you know it's certainly not the orthodox uh, understanding that people have for what you need to be able to do something under capitalism will will we keep going sure thing And this does not happen because it is an ethical or moral demand of communism, but because it is economically not otherwise possible. In fact, the emancipation of labor, the development and flourishing of free man, is also an ethical demand. But this only proves once more that the economy and ethics can only realize each other. They become both merged into unity. B. The Socially Average Working Time by Marx and Engels. In our analysis of the conditions of communist production and distribution, we started from the Marxist analysis of the domination of the working class and, as mentioned above, we did not hold on to quotations because they never prove the correctness of a view, but at most can clarify a representation. For those of us who find serious anarchist deviations we want to confront our view with that of Marx and Engels. It will become apparent that these deviations were their essential view of communist society. In this context, it should also be noted that the Bolshevik stupidity of producing goods without a unit of account is a completely foreign element for Marx and Engels. Engels clearly states the socially average working time as a unit of account. Quote, Society can simply calculate how many hours of labor are contained in a steam engine, a bushel of wheat of the last harvest, or a hundred square yards of cloth of a certain quality. It could therefore never occur to it still to express the quantities of labor put into the products, quantities which it will then know directly and in their absolute amounts, in a third product, in a measure which, besides, is only relative, fluctuating, inadequate though formerly unavoidable for lack of a better one, rather than express them in their natural, adequate, absolute measure, time. Hence, on the assumptions we made above, society will not assign values to products, end quote. Marx also very clearly states the working hour as the arithmetic union. At the discussion of the well-known Robinson on the island, He says of this island inhabitant who built himself his entire economic life, quote, the need itself forces him to distribute his time exactly between his different functions. Whether the one takes up more and the other less space in his overall activity depends on the greater or lesser difficulty to be overcome in order to achieve the intended effect. Experience teaches him this, and our Robinson, who rescued the clock ledger, ink, and pen from the shipwreck, soon begins to keep a record of himself as a good Englishman. His inventory contains a list of all the utensils he possesses, the various tasks he has been called upon to perform in order to produce them, and finally, the working time that certain quanta of these various products cost him on average. 
all the relations between Robinson and the things that make up his self-created wealth are so simple and transparent that even Mr. M. Worth should be able to understand them without any particular mental effort, end quote. Quote, let us finally, for a change, imagine an association of free people who work with social means of production and self-competently spend their many individual labor power as a social labor power. All the provisions of Robinson's work are repeated here, only socially instead of individually, end quote. Okay, thanks for that, Will. That was really good. I don't know how you read the Engels quote and passed it correctly. <laughs> what the hell is wrong with 19th century literature? Seriously, how many commas and different, like, I don't know how you did it. I was lost. Um, what jumps out here? Let's have a look, see what jumps out. There was a, an interesting bit we left just before we started into the Marx and Engelsology here, where... He talks about, this is getting back to a kind of, you know, this fear of norm, normative kind of stuff in Marxism. And this does not happen because it is an ethical or moral demand on communism, but because it is economically not otherwise possible. This is labor time planning. In fact, the emancipation of labor, the development and, and flourishing of free man is also an ethical demand. But this only proves once more that the economy and ethics can only realize each other they become both merged in unity. How many ethics courses did they teach you in economics departments now? Anybody? Is there an ethics course taught in any economics parts across the world? I just think it was a, a nice way of putting it. How, like, the idea of communism is this kind of combination of ethics with economics. And it comes out of this idea of a labour time accounting, which is a necessary component for a, a communist state. I don't know. I, I find that quite, quite interesting. Alan. Uh, yeah, I think uh, this this stuff about you know ethics merging into the economy. It's really just. Uh, I mean, I, I guess that's what Marx basically had again, or like when he if he would call something utopian. I guess that that was kind of the the core of it. That it was a, a proposal of like, well, let's just be on our best behavior without actually coming up with like a a system logic that would make people want to do that, you know? So I, I guess that's what that's getting at. Okay. Onto the, onto this kind of uh, Marxology. Anybody have any, any comments on this? That quote from Engels is from, I think the uh, anti during, which I, I have not read. I have read this Robinson Crusoe stuff. It's within the first hundred pages, I think in, in volume one. I, I think it's hard to deny that this was, uh, repeatedly what was in Marx's and Engels' ideas for communism. It's very hard to make an argument that that labor time planning wasn't their vision. I think we don't seem to have any comments on this stuff. So let's, do you want to take the, the next bit then? Sure. We see here that Marx also knows a production calculation for, quote, an association of free people and that on the basis of the working hour. Where Marx replaces Robinson with free people, we now want to read society's accounting as follows. Its inventory contains a list of the articles of daily use that it owns, the various activities that it is engaged in its production. Finally, the working hours that certain quanta of these various products cost it on average. All relationships between members of society and things here are so simple that anyone can grasp them. Marx accepts this bookkeeping of society in general for a production process with common means of production. Thus, whether communism is still little developed or whether it has already reached its highest development, this means that economic life in communism can go through various stages of development, but the category of average social working time remains the dormant pole. If we now come to the individual distribution of the social product, then we also see working hours as a measure of individual consumption. Quote, we will assume, but merely for the sake of a parallel with the production of commodities, that the share of each individual producer in the means of subsistence is determined by his labor time. Labor time would, in that case, play a double part. Its apportionment in accordance with a definite social plan 
maintains the proper proportion between the different kinds of work to be done and the various wants of the community. On the other hand, it also serves as a measure of the portion of the common labor borne by each individual and of his share in the part of the total product destined for individual consumption. The social relations of the individual producers with regard to their labor and to its products are in this case perfectly simple and intelligible. And that with regard not only to production but also to distribution, end quote. Elsewhere, too, it can be seen that Marx sees working time as a basic category of the communist economy. Quote, in the case of socialized production, the money capital is eliminated. Society distributes labor power and means of production to the different branches of production. The producers may, for all it matters, receive paper vouchers entitling them to withdraw from the social supplies of consumer goods a quantity corresponding to their labor time. These vouchers are not money, they do not circulate." End quote. The entire communist economy is included in these sentences. If individual working time is to be the measure for the product to be consumed individually, then the product mass must also be measured with the same measure. In other words, the products must express how much human labor, measured by time, how many socially average working hours they contain. This presupposes, however, that the other categories of production, means of production, raw materials, and auxiliary materials, are measured with the same measure, so that the entire production calculation in the operations must be based on the socially average working hour. This section is a little bit kind of boring if you've read the book, because you know what's coming. So there's not too much beef in here. But it, there's one interesting thing here that I think that we kind of hit upon last week or maybe the week before, which is about the idea of the different stages of communism, which I think leads to a lot of confused debates uh, within kind of the communist left in general. Marx, let's let's read this a bit here. Marx accepts this bookkeeping of society in general for a production process with common means production. Thus, whether communism is still little developed or whether it has already achieved its highest development. This means that economic life in communism can go through various stages of development, but the category of average social working time remains the dormant pole. I think this gets to what Herman was saying at the end of last week's session where he was talking about the idea for the danger of allowing everything going into say the tax rate going to 100 percent because at that point you would have a a lose your control over the number of hours you need to work and you would have councils people you'd have the, essentially the workers council bureaucracy or whatever telling people what they need to do to have a certain amount of output so like capitalism develops with a single measure through lots of different forms, you know, we see capitalism morphing itself through its different stages of development. We should see communism develop in, in a way that probably we can't, you know, we can only dream or guess about how it could develop. But always in and amongst this is this idea of the average social working time being the dominant pole like capitalism. Like any economic society needs to know what they are capable of doing. And communism is, is no different. Patrick. Yeah. I mean, it, it feels like the key point in this, in this Marx quote in the capital volume two is just the non fungibility of the vouchers or, you know, labor chits. And they're starting to get into a little bit of the, of some of the things I'm wondering about, you know, like, I mean, time is, is one unit of measure, but you know, there's material goods too. And the, uh, the accounting for that, you know, d do you translate that all into some? So when you say material goods, Patrick, like, do you mean like the inputs? Inputs. The, yeah. yeah. So they would have a labor time price associated with them. Converted. Too. Yeah. Everything is in terms of labor time. So our fixed capital and our circulating capital equivalents. So you, you bring up a very important point here, this idea of the vouchers, they do not circulate. Now, 
the reason why Marx is getting into this uh, idea of not circulating because he doesn't want the kind of value form to kind of reemerge again whereby people have perhaps maybe a hoard of money and then they're able to basically put that money to work in a way that is detrimental to the entire system. You know, you could imagine a whole load of people saving up money, buying a shit ton of weapons and then paying other people to come and lead a counter revolution, for example. I think that like this idea of them not being able to circulate I, I think that might be ameliorated by technology. I think that when it comes to a modern computer tech communist society, I think there's a need like, you know, if, if, my, if I want to give a kid like a, a birthday present and send them a fiver in the post, like I think that kind of microtransaction things is not a problem. And I think this worry about circulation may be ameliorated with modern technology, but that's another I think that's something that's open for discussion, but certainly I feel like that can be implemented in a way that is not a systemic risk to a communist society. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Alan? Yeah, I guess since the uh, the labor voucher, you know, like you were saying, give a, give a fiver to your buddy for their birthday or whatever as a gift, that makes sense because you can, you can take that to the, you know, store of goods and get consumer goods with it, but you can't go to the store and get more labor power with it, right? Labor power isn't there at the store for you to buy. So I think that's where circulation doesn't come in. You can't you can't hoard your labor vouchers as a way of like capital investment in a way. But it's you, just more consumer goods. But you could hold you could pay somebody with your labor vouchers. That's the point. I could pay you, Alan. I could save up labor vouchers and I could say, here's twenty grand. Do you want to come with me and like uh, hijack a gold shipment or something that i think that's the fear alex yeah i mean you could you could lend them as interest which i mean up till this point you know i've not really been convinced that they haven't just invented a new form of money albeit you know a form of money that makes it explicit what the degree of excess work that, that you're 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 doing for, for the common good there's the, then this sentence gets dropped in there and that seems huge to me what interest though because if you know, one hour is one hour. It doesn't. No, I I, no I, I I lend you like ten hours worth of vouchers. You pay me about twenty hours worth of vouchers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, will. Well, yeah. So we, we've raised a couple hypotheticals, right? Like, what happens when you need to build a house, right? And so we're saying that you can use the labor vouchers to command other labor. Or not, because, you know, like, what about Ferris Bueller, right? He takes the day off, everyone thinks he's wicked sick, he gets a bunch of gifts, right? Now he can, you know, build himself a mansion, right? I, what, what, why do they need to circulate, right? I don't think it's a big deal if we can't send fivers to our grandkids. I, I just think, like, I, I know what you mean, but, like, you know, when you when you talk about this stuff to people, and they pick holes. So, for example, like, I buy something for somebody because they forgot to bring their wallet, and they owe me, like, 20 quid. Right. And you want to like, does that mean that they have to go and buy buy your shopping for you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like I just talking about in the general run and the mill of normal life, that may be something that something that should be able to be facilitated once it doesn't cause the destruction of the system. Yeah, I mean, you could just set up a tab at your grocery. Right. And then pay them back with your labor tokens once you have them directly. Because, you know, the, the, you'd say the exact same thing about if, if you concede, okay, then the, you can circulate in some areas, then you can pick holes in that just as easily as picking holes when they don't circulate, right? Well, well I would say it's a, ma it's a matter of scale is the problem, you know. That's, that's the way I look at it. It's a scale thing. Like, if, if one person is amassing 15 times, 100 times the amount of income that he should be, you know something dodgy is going on. The fact that like 1% of my transactions kind of shift between my friends or me or whatever the hell, you know, to, to me, that's that's not a problem for communism. A problem with communism, if, if the, the ability to circulate will lead to hordes, which people will use for accumulation or nefarious purposes against the interests of the system. Right. No, I agree that, that that's absolutely the, the problem. It like, I, I think with modern technology, like, you know, like in Marx's time, if you had vouchers and you're printing out, and they, they could easily circulate unless you stamped them with the person's ID. But in, in modern technology, it's 
it's very easy to to, to follow digital transactions. You know, I'm just saying, no, I'm not putting it forward. I'm just saying, like, there are probably are ways that you could build this with like encryption and stuff so that it's not abusive. The tracking, and you know, whatever. This is a thing for society to determine, to be honest, for me. It's the way I look at it. But um, I think Donald had his hand up. Yeah, no, I was just, you, you pretty much made the point I was going to say. So, like, you could imagine that there, if we're being very modern about this and talking about like digital wallets, for example, that you wouldn't even need active human monitoring or interference. It, it would be very clear if there was like an employer employee private relationship or a like a rent payment to someone who's acting as a landlord, like, you know, this kind of like regular payments of labor vouchers and stuff. I think it would be, yeah, I think th- those kind of things would be picked up on very easily if you were going to go down that road. I think Alex might have had his hand up too. Yeah, the, the, the tab of the grocery store is just reinventing money. I mean, all, all money is, is, is death anyway. These vouchers are just death. I'm owed uh, an hour's worth of things. Uh, once you start making tabs, it's just another way of, of like, uh, you've just created more money. Well, I think there's an important distinction, though, Alex, uh, when we're talking about money, because like deep into the money form, the idea of the wage in a society, that allows exploitation at the root. OK, but when people are paid labor time, it destroys that it destroys that element. Now, sometimes I think last week when we were discussing these, we were kind of myself included. I had to go through when I was editing this and I tried to edit in the right word where I said the wrong one, you know. So I'm more coherent in the edit than I was in the live stream. But like, you won all the arguments then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I win everything. It's brilliant. Uh, but like, so the idea like the, of the, like under capitalism, you, you're exploited, you are paid your wage and then out of your wage, you pay tax. Like uh, under the labor time voucher system, you get all of your value that you're, that you've worked and then you pay a, a tax, but you don't, there is not that exploitation element and it's that exploitation element that makes money money and makes labor time different i think that's very important for us to understand marx wouldn't call it money now i know like it, it's a form of i don't know what we would call it like we call it labor tokens or labor time accounting yeah you know, I, I, as opposed I, I to money I, I would say this is still money but it does make we don't like the word exploitation but the excess work explicit but i would say yeah. it's still doing the function of money it's still doing a payment function and a, yeah, but it, it's and the, the units of account and the units of store. It's all the things that, that, that money is. But it's not all of them, you know, because it's fundamentally different than many money forms that's been around before. Because all money forms have had exploitation at their root as a core component, like the wage form allowed, you know, it's built into the, it's built into the money form. You know, we might want to call it something else, but like it, it's different than any other type of money. Yeah, okay, well. You know, like... It, it's different to, to any other... other it, I mean, it's, it's never been done, so yes. It's different to any other type of money, but it's still maintain it, it, it's a it, form. It has a load of similar functions. Yes. You know, that's what I would say. Like, and then you get into the... Well, you know, the like, other three functions of money, was it units of account, store, and is it exchange? It does those things, but like... Uh, they, 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 that, that's nobody like, how economists define money, and it, it does those three things. Yeah, but they're bourgeois asshole economists. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Chris wants to say, Chris. Yeah, I wanted to say, isn't the point that it, it, it doesn't circulate? So it isn't money because it is, it's missing one of the fundamental aspects of money. Well, the, the, that was it. I mean, it wasn't until we hit that sentence that I thought this is something different to money. And like, even if you're going to, you know, save up your labor tokens, like, what are you going to do in the meantime? Starve? <laughs> it's like, I, I guess here's an analogy. Um, so like in the, it was in the 1700s where the Royal Navy would uh, give people rum rations. So, you know, so what sailors would do is just hoard their rum rations till they got, you know, tons of rum and could just get shit faced. So they, what they started doing was watering it down and giving them watered down rum every day which became grog. And the thing about it is you can't hoard it because you would need, you know, barrels and barrels and barrels of it. So I I think there is kind of an inbuilt aspect of it that prevents hoarding. I'm not saying it's foolproof though. Like we can think of so many scenarios where uh, frauds can be uh, undertaken, but yeah. 
like say for example right you can't exploit in the workplace anymore what's some entrepreneurial asshole going to try and do they're going to set up a cult right they're going to set up a, a cult and they're going to get people to physically give them their products like so we're going to end up with like stuff like whereby commodities start to circulate i just think that th- this stuff is an inevitability of social relations that there's going to be on the edges shit going on but like the the point certainly here in marx's time anyway specifically about circulation which is very important is that like you need to prevent those forms becoming a dominant pole in society much like say for example the us dollar and bitcoin the us state doesn't really give a shit about bitcoin right now because it's used for what fraud child porn and drugs and maybe getting a hitman right and it's a small percentage of the economy but if bitcoin started to actually like threaten the dollar as world reserve currency then shit would get real and i think this is the way we should be approaching this element of circulation that that's my own personal view somebody had their hand up i'm not exactly sure i think it was chris yeah uh the one other the point that i guess uh i'd like to make is i mean it, it how important democracy is for this because i can't conceive of a, a scheme where a labor accounting regime exists for one class but a lot of the um infrastructure is run by slaves like <laughs> like robinson for instance who yeah who who did so much work himself but yet you know he had the uh the ship's carpenter's tool chest just happened to wash ashore and he had a personal slave so <laughs> it's kind of an ironic uh choice of character i guess <laughs> and, and, yeah. or just like you know so so many raw materials are um sourced in the global south and per, you know made into goods in in the global north and 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 these uh differences could could be exploited i'm saying it's a maybe a necessary but not sufficient condition for uh communism but uh, i don't want to get too bogged down here Oh, that's what reading groups are for. Bogging down. Okay, final section to read. Uh, Donald, someone to say something first. Uh, no, well, I was just going to kind of say that we it would probably take a, a lot more time to get into it, but I think there are, maybe we can come back to later, pretty important reasons why it actually isn't a form of money, that that's all bound up in value and exchange value and the role of money in a generalized commodity production economy and yeah, I think we can maybe we can come back to that because you probably want to go ahead. So. That is a good point as well, like that there isn't a distinction between, you know, value and price. You know, there's just there's just price. Uh, there's a, just the socialist price, which is the average socially necessary labor time. No patents going on, no ex- no weird stuff going on, dragging surplus here, there and everywhere to certain nefarious ends, rents all over the place. So I think that element too is being surgically extracted. So that's another important one. It's not just exploitation, but also these these other variations between price and value. Okay, who wants to take this last section? We've got two pages left. Carson. However, it should be noted that Marx did not raise the distribution issue in absolute terms, but gave the impression that another distribution method would indeed be possible. The producers may, for all that matters, receive paper value or in terms of working time, merely for the sake of a parallel with the production of commodities. If one takes the measure of individual consumption, it seems that there is a free choice of the distribution system. Marxistically, however, this is by no means the case. The reason for this ambiguity lies in the fact that Marx saw full-fledged communism as a take-as-needed, with working time not being the measure of individual consumption. This measure would only be valid for the transitional period from capitalism to mature communism. This is clearly expressed in the so-called rent glossy. This also sheds light on the Marxism of those who see state capitalism as a form of transition to communism. Quote, what we have to deal with here is a communist society, not as it is developed on its own foundations, but on the contrary, just as it emerges from capitalist society, highlighted by Marx, which is thus in every respect economically, morally, and intellectually still stands with the birthmarks of the old society from whose womb it emerges. Accordingly, the individual producer receives back from society after the deductions have been made. 
exactly what he gives to it. What he has given to it is his individual quantum of labor. For example, the social working day consists in the sum of the individual hours of work. The individual labor time of the individual producer is the part of the social working day contributed by him. He's sharing it. He receives a certificate from society that he has furnished such and such amount of labor after deducting his labor from the common funds. And with this certificate, he draws from the social stock of the means of consumption as much as the same amount of labor cost. The same amount of labor which he has given to society in one form, he receives back in another. Quote again, in a higher phase of common society, after the enslaving subordination of the individual to the division of labor, and there within also the antithesis between mental and physical labor has vanished, after labor has become not only a means of life, but life's prime want, after the productive forces have also increased with the all-around development of the individual, and all the springs of cooperative wealth flow more abundantly. Only then can the narrow horizon of bourgeois right be crossed in its entirety and society inscribed on its banners from each according to his ability, from each according to his needs. Great. That was great, Carson. Yeah, so this is getting to the, the point I think that Herman was making last week as well, is that like th- this idea of jumping to a society where everything is based on according to his needs, each according to his ability, is really only in a fo- in a higher phase of communist society, which whereby like the the output levels are so high compared to our labor input levels that it's not so much that it's a hundred percent taxation. That's not what Marx is getting to here. I think this is a correct interpretation. He's getting to the fact that like say if our all our all our work is done in one hour, everybody does one hour a week, and like thirty percent of it goes to the communist tax and seventy percent of that is personal use at that point like labor becomes something that you want to enjoy and like that people are not really don't really care so much about getting the the consumption levels back because at this point you know labor is a joy and the antithesis between mental and physical labor has vanished you know and i I think this makes quite a lot of sense we shouldn't be seeing this idea of i think the 100 percent taxation of what communism is but i think much more so when society has got to such a productive level that the idea of like being paid for your labor kind of essentially disintegrates and falls into the river of history or something and is from a previous time. Anybody want to talk on this? Do they think that's a a good interpretation or Alex? Yeah, uh, I, I'd say it is. I read, uh, I can't remember what, what it was called. It was a book by Ashley Le Guin, uh, which presented a, a, a communist society. And someone in it asked the question, who does the horrible jobs? Who, like, deals with sewage and stuff like that? And the, the guy answers, well, mostly young men looking for status. I, I, I think we'd need more than just, there'd have to be a moral or ethical element to, to work, uh, I think, more than just do this and you'll get uh, an hour of standard wage. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I also think, though, that, like, you know, the actual morals in the societies will change. They'll come out of these social relations. And I, I do not doubt that, like, instead of having Donald Trump up there saying you're fired as, like, a paragon of, of manhood, there will be entirely different. You know, and th- there was under the Soviet system, you know, the Stakhanovite movement or whatever was trying to do a similar thing for productivity in a different way. But I, I yeah, absolutely. I think it would unde- undeniably lead to a massive change in the, in the culture, fundamentally. Chris? Yeah, uh, and I think all of this can only make sense in the context of a broader class struggle. I think that has to be assumed here. And in the book, in different parts, kind of alludes to it. You know, saying that we can uphold this if we're, you know, constantly uh, vigilant against counter-revolutionary forces or whatever. But there, there has to be a, a, a normative foundation or, or, or at least a common purpose that everyone's working towards the same thing. Carson. Yeah, I was like, whenever I read about the um, way in which, like in a future society or like later down the line, the way in which we think of work, I've been reading 
Alistair McIntyre, how he talks about how sections of life are compartmentalized in terms of labor and you're a different person out of the job or from being example a waiter or a cook in you know the chaotic environment is one of the issues within society and it's when mark says i think it was the gossip program which he thinks the difference between like you'd be a fisher in the morning writer in the day or i forget the specific order but for me at least i see labor and rest of society is a more integrated whole as opposed to now where it seems like we have very stark divisions between, okay, now I'm going to do fair labor and my job. And then afterwards I'm going to be part of either work on myself or my community. And I see it more the much more integrated within the society and knowing how things basic function work, your water comes from, and these duties that are usually stratified above society to like a state level in our current day becomes more integrated in a sense to a whole of one's life as opposed to maybe more kind of separate divided sections of society yeah absolutely just just think lads of all the podcasters we're going to have think of all the all the podcasts it's going to be fantastic we're going to have seven billion podcasts fucking brilliant anybody else here oh will there's something in here later on where i think you know they talk about kind of overcoming the division of labor and basically say something like, uh, you know, it's a struggle for power and we need to be conducted as such. Because I, I think as, as someone else alluded to, like this all needs to happen in the context of a revolution, right? And so there are going to be people who already had privileged positions in society that are going to have a lot of interest in holding on to those privileged positions. And, you know, it's a struggle for power to deprive them of that, right? Yeah, big time. Like, I, I do think things are quite different now versus, say, like when the Soviets had to do it in 1917, because I think the proletariat in developed countries have a way, way, way more skills than they would have had at that time. So I, I think the power of the bourgeoisie or the specialists has been largely re reduced. If I think about like the, all the different jobs I've had, I know like they might have been more techie jobs or whatever, but it's like... You could have, you, I think it's fair to say, like, you could get rid of most of the managers overnight and the workers could still run the thing pretty much fine. Like, I think an awful lot of the the skills in management is actually around finance. I would expect the specialist class to not have the same influence, but definitely it's a, you know, it's it's a power battle. You know, this book is not getting into that only at the very edges. It's fundamental to underlying to any of this and that is class struggle i think the things that we can learn from this from lenin and those people is i think they had a great understanding of power to be honest with you not so much the political economy but like i think you know if you're talking about you know kind of political genius levels you know we might have disagreements over like what was done but certainly as any type of communist movement, we really do need to understand and have a focus on the power element. Like none of this shit is possible without that power struggle. Anybody else have anything to say? I have a couple of things I, I forgot to say at the start that I'd like to say about last week's session. There's a couple of like one or two simple points if any, if everybody is done. So I think uh, last week we, we opened with a, a little bit on, I don't know if people remember, we were talking about how they use the term labor force instead of labor power. I've been talking to Herman since then, and he was saying that it's labor power, that he's going to change it to labor power to make keep it consistent with what it normally would be called. And also there was one little bit here, I think, in, in chapter two, just a little tiny section here that we missed and I thought was probably fairly important thing to point out. Yeah, so this is getting getting back to this idea about like how the value kind of dynamics reemerged quite quickly when they went to the NEP in Russia, and talking about you know the uh, Lenin's great quote about how like uh, we're not driving the car, where it's being driven by somebody else, and this section here we kind of skipped over. I meant to talk about it at the time, but let me just read this little section here, Andreev declared that various unions support the wage demands because former Mensheviks and social revolutionaries permeate the trade union apparatus. This was followed by a cleansing of the trade union apparatus. 
I think this points to kind of an important thing like that some of the more terrible things that happened in the Soviet system if without a fundamental understanding of the value form and the implications for getting your your measure wrong going for a you know a money measure instead of a labor time measure and under, not really having a grasp or suppressing those that have the grasp of the difference like it kind of leads to this i think undoubtedly leads to a certain amount of paranoia about why the apparatus is working against the the interests the idea that unions were supporting it because you know there was counter revolutionaries you know mensheviks and social revolutionaries is the kind of seed i think of a lot of bad stuff that ended up happening does that, that we want to comment on that section we kind of missed it last week or do people think i'm pushing it by bringing the value form into into this stuff yeah i think it's a stretch Unless anybody's anything else to say, I think we'll uh, hit it and quit it. Uh, Donald wants to say something. Donald. Yeah, just very, very quickly at the end, just in case we forget the next day. So we would just talk briefly about the role of money and whether the labour vouchers kind of constitute money. And I just want to push back a little bit on it before we finish up. So like the role of money in capitalism, uh, as we would understand it, is kind of like a feedback mechanism. So the law of value can operate through like mismatches between uh, value like the snlt of a good in the current conditions of production and the exchange value or the price so labor vouchers can't fulfill the role of money you know because goods and services including labor power aren't commodities anymore so yeah when you abolish that kind of ability for what the functionality of money would be then the role of money is is gone you know so that's all i wanted to say Cool. Alex, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I disagree with that. I don't think the exploitation is inherent in money itself. It's inherent in capitalism. So, for example, in a feudal society, you're still exploited, but not via money. But, and money still has all the functions that money has, still a unit of account, a store, a, a medium of exchange, but it's not the mechanism whereby you're, you're exploited. You're exploited because you have to either produce, do, you know, days of work or produce for the, the, the feudal lord. But, but I would say, Alex, there was still wage labour in, in feudalism as well. It wasn't all... Right. Uh, okay, but uh, peasants in general, uh, uh, a lot of feudal societies with peasants aren't ba- based on wage labour. I don't think that's where the exploitation is coming from, even though there's still exploitation. I think money had the same functions in feudalism as it would now. It's just that the wage, the actual explicit being paid a wage wasn't as prominent, but money was of the same form. But money was the same form, but it wasn't the, the means of, of, of exploitation. Not as not to the same extent. So I'm saying it's not it. inherent in money itself. Uh, it, 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 it's a property of, uh, of capital. Capitalism is exploited. Wage labor is, you know, well, it can be exploited. <laughs> but... Like, I would say that money doesn't necessarily have to have exploitation happening, but money facilitates exploitation. Right. right. Labor time planning denies that ability. Yes. That's- Which doesn't mean that labor vouchers are not money. Well, you know, like this is one of those just terminology things. I think that people like that, you know, Marx, you know, gets into all the time, you know, her. I don't know. This is like one of those things like, is, is, is yeah, a color revolution? Marx, yeah, Marx, like, really long, dull derivation of money in the first couple of chapters makes no mention of exploitation. Uh, it, 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 it talks a lot about how many linens you can exchange for a coat. That's true, but he also brings in the price value distinction, which there isn't here. Sure. So, you know, I know, like, I don't have anybody have any problem, call, like, you know, in reality, to say, that, oh, labor time money, just call it that, like, or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I'm just, it's like, you know, some people say like, oh, you know, the color revolutions that are in the Eastern countries aren't revolutions because the, you know, from a Marxist point of view, because the relations between, you know, the owners and the, the workers hasn't changed. And you go like, you know, some people use these terms in different ways. I, I don't really mind too much once we understand that the differences yeah. are in it. I think Illuminatus, or not, was it Chris first, then Illuminatus? Yeah, I mean, a, a, a can of beans can be used as a unit of account or, you know, a store of value. But it's money emerges for a very specific purpose, is for circulation. And uh, I, I just want to leave it at that. 
No, money doesn't amount to a circulation. It, it, it amounted initially as a way to make an army. The, the, the point was, wasn't circulation. You, you said to all the peasants, give me a certain number of these tokens at the end of the year or I'll kill you. And then you pay your army in those tokens. Right. But so the you army could buy things. things. You, just want, you want to fund your army for free. Y yeah. But I mean, it, under the presumption that the army would go and use their money to buy commodities, right? Yeah, yeah, so you, it's a way, it's, a, but it's not the circulation that's part of it. You want people to give you goods to, to fund your army, and it, it, money's a really good way of doing that. And I think it's Adam Smith first noted, noted that. I just love, uh, I love this MMT money origin shit. You're going to get me here all day for another two hours. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I do as well, yeah. <laughs> um, Julian. Yeah, you already mentioned what I wanted to say. Oh, that's the way I like it. Great minds, Julian. Great minds. On this episode, you heard the team tune, The Order of the Phronic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. And if you'd like to help out the show, please remember to head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollars.